Welcome everybody. This uh, presentation is the history of the militia in America. Uh, also, you could call it the history of the security and defense power for we the people because in our country, people are supposed to compose the militia, or more accurately, the body of we the people or the able body of the people are supposed to compose the militia which uh, the militia are for emergencies and for anything where that is necessary to the security of a free state. I'm going to go through some fundamental principles here and so you'll see where we the people fit in the hierarchy of authority. And uh, on this chart here, it's it could be presented as a pyramid, but I have it top to bottom. <clears throat> you have God as the supreme authority. Under that, we have the people. In Western political philosophy, um, <clears throat> under the people, the U.S. Constitution, Bill of Rights and Amendments, and the 50 state constitutions. And under that, constitutional acts, statutes, and laws. Those three words are used interchangeably. When a law is passed, it's called an act. When it's put in the U.S. statutes at large, for instance, federal law, it's called a statute, U.S. statutes at large. And obviously, everybody knows the word law. Uh, it's a little, I got a little jumbled there at the bottom. I, that was correct before, but uh, the question I'm asking is, if the 1903 Militia Act is unconstitutional, and it is, where would it fit in the hierarchy of authority? So um, anybody is free to comment whenever they want. Um, just could just say oh, something. You give a, a just comment real, real, to it, where oh, it would fit in there. I was going to ask you, could you give a real quick uh, description of the uh, Militia Act, please? Right, I'll do that. That's coming up. Oh, okay. Just, uh, if you're going to speak, speak to what I'm saying at the moment, okay? The answer to the question is, <clears throat> the 1903 Militia Act doesn't fit anywhere in this pyramid. It has no authority, but it's still on the books. And it, uh, it uh, repealed the 1792 one of the two 1792 Militia Acts, May 2nd and May 8th, it repealed the May 8th Militia Act, which you'll see up here coming up. Therefore, the Constitution supersedes Acts statutes in that pyramid. And Acts statutes cannot change the Constitution. In other words, something under some... If we're here, nothing that happens here can change anything above it. The people can't change God. The Constitution can't change the people. Laws, acts, and statutes can't change the Constitutions, federal or state. So laws cannot change the Constitution. This is confirmed at, at uh, Article 6, Clause 2 of the U.S. Constitution. This Constitution and the laws which shall be made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law. <clears throat> so, um, made in pursuance thereof means the laws have to adhere to this constitution. Even though they're both called the supreme law, in the, in the sentence, the Constitution comes first, so it supersedes the laws of the United States. And that's, that's explained in uh, JBS videos, I believe, mm -hmm. and it's also explained by Dr. Edwin Vieira, Jr., who's a top constitutional scholar in the country. <clears throat> Since the Constitution is the supreme law, then the laws of the Union, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, also includes, I repeat that again, the laws of the Union also includes this Constitution and to execute the laws of the Union also includes 
to enforce this Constitution. Any questions on that? So in the phrase in Clause 15, which is, which is a clause that I'm focused on, it says, the militia, uh, uh, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, <clears throat> suppress insurrections and repel invasions. So the militia to execute the laws of the Union includes in that enforcing of the Constitution. Therefore, the Clause 15 enumeration of power of the militia composed of the people to execute the laws of the Union means that we the people have the enumerated power to enforce this Constitution when it's unenforced or when necessary to the security of a free state in the first clause of the Second Amendment. Okay, this, um, I'm going to quote John Adams and there's, uh, you, you probably all recognize these three, Franklin on, Franklin on the left at uh, John Adams and uh, Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Jefferson was tasked with writing the draft, uh, I guess because he was the best writer at Connell Congress. Okay, what is the necessity today? Three necessities. Take the moral high ground, take the constitutional high ground, restore the power of we the people. Here's John Adams. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And so, I like John Adams' quote, I wouldn't have it here if I didn't, and I'm in full agreement with other instructors here, Reverend Kraft, Mr. Earl Campbell, Mr. Campbell, Pastor Lear, and my first year here as an instructor in 2012, I really hadn't focused much at all on taking the moral high ground. I heard what Reverend Kraft was saying. If you don't have the moral high ground, you can't get to the constitutional high ground. You'd just be constantly climbing uphill and uphill and never getting to the top. But now I get it. I get so the one comes before the two. This is the assertion. Returning to constitutional republican principles and restoring the constitutional operation of civil government cannot be achieved without the people and public officials first embracing sound moral principles. This is the Declaration, the United Declaration of the 13 United States of America. And the United is a small u in that, in that document. Commonly called the Declaration of Independence. Is the uh, photograph of the actual document. It's on the website there, archives.gov. Focusing on the three words in the upper left. There's a close-up of the three words. And you can see the beautiful cursive writing. And I don't know if you can see the first line of cursive under people. It says provide, about halfway through the, the sentence, it says provide for the common defense. And it's, a, it's defense. If you look up close, I can see it here on the computer. But that's one of the, that's the preamble right there. Those two lines are the preamble. Okay, we the people, the superseding constitutional authority as enumerated in the documents from the Declaration that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving the just powers from the consent of the governed. The key phrase being uh, governments deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, the people. From the Constitution in the preamble, we the people, <clears throat> and then skipping down to the end of the preamble, do ordain and establish this Constitution. So since the people ordained and established it, they're above it. You go back to the pyramid chart, people are above the Constitution. We the people, again, this is a little more detail. We the people, and this is Dr. Vieira, I'm getting this from Vieira, the first line here. We the people are a branch of government, which is not written in any history book. Because the people as a unit are the superseding natural and constitutional authority for the unanimous 1776 Declaration for the United States Constitution preamble and per state constitutions. Every, con every state constitution has some kind of language that says the government officials must adhere to the orders and instructions of the people. And there's 
a more detailed paragraph from the declaration in the middle there. They endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and prop, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted, deriving the just powers from the consent of the government. We, the people, do ordain and establish the Constitution for the United States of America. Okay, the New Hampshire Constitution, Bill of Rights. All government of right originates from the people, is founded in consent, and instituted for the general good. All power residing originally in, and being derived from the people. All the magistrates and officers of the government are their substitutes and agents, and at all times accountable to them. Okay, a couple of questions. Or one question here. Why is the superseding authority of we, the people, the, brand, the, the chief branch of government, and why is the exercise of that necessary authority so important? We see today in the early 21st century that officials at all levels of government have run amok. Not the government run amok, the officials occupying government have run amok. The government is what the, what's in the Constitution. That's the government. Mainly for the last 100 years, going back to the beginning of the 20th century, since the people's power to execute the laws was officially but unconstitutionally disbanded. And that was done by law, act, statute, law. Frederick Bastiat. I did a presentation a few years ago on uh, this book, The Law, written by the French political economist. And this quote here, Each of us has a natural right from God to defend his person, his liberty, and his property. What is the end, and this is, uh, the quote is from John Locke's Second Treatise on Civil Government, 1690. <clears throat> what is the purpose of civil government? It is the common or collective defense of life, liberty, and property. Collective is the, is the word that Bastiat used in the law. Common is the word we find in the Constitution and in uh, Locke. 77. <clears throat> the Declaration, again, the same phrase, to secure these rights, governments are instituted. So, if you are a Free State Project anarchist in New Hampshire, which they, a the, the definition of anarchy is no government. So, could, a, could an anarcho-type government Secure their rights. Secure the rights of the people. No. Absolutely. Correct. <clears throat> if you don't have common defense, we don't have it today because it was disbanded a, a century ago. So our rights are not being secured. U.S. Constitution from the preamble to provide for the common defense. From our, the first clause of Article 1, Section 8 of the enumerated powers of Congress to provide for the common defense. And that's one of the reasons that <clears throat> federal government can tax is to provide for the common defense. So to defend life, liberty, and property is equal to the phrase to secure these rights. So the declaration phrase to secure these rights through the defense of life, liberty, and property and, as, and he goes back up to the, what, what is the end of civil government? Common defense of life, liberty, and property. Okay, our government, constitutional republican government, <clears throat> the branches, this is another pyramid type in uh, prose without the diagram. Um, <clears throat> number one, in the document, we the people, the people of the several states, the people of the several states it's another phrase in Article 1, Section 1. And two fa this is from Vieira, Dr. Vieira. And this is one of his, there'll be a photo, I'll be bringing this up again. This is one of Dr. Vieira's books, uh, Constitutional Homemade Security, The Nation in Arms. This was written in 2007. And um, he says, the people are a branch and there are two parts to that branch, the militia and the voting electorate. 
And then you have uh, the legislature, con the state legislatures in Congress make law. You have the <coughs> rep representatives or in states, the assemblies of the House of Burgess or the House of Representatives in the Senate. And as uh, Catherine White mentioned in her, her lecture um, on the 7th, and she mentioned the 17th Amendment, the intent of the Constitution was that the senators, U.S. senators, represent the states mm -hmm. and uh, that the Congress represents the people. And then the, you have the executive who executes law and the judicial court decisions. And to prove the, uh, in, in the U.S. Constitution, proof of Republican government, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. Okay, Noah Webster, his first dic American dictionary. Militia, noun, body of soldiers, which back then, every, basically every able-bodied man was a soldier when needed. Uh, in a state, enrolled for discipline, you're part of a comp militia company in your local, local community, but not engaged in actual service except in emergencies as distinguished from regular troops whose sole occupation is war or military service. The militia of a country are the able-bodied men organized into companies, regiments, and brigades with officers of all grades and required by law to attend military exercises on certain days only, maybe three or four times a year, they would muster, but at other times left to pursue the usual occupations. And. Um, Quote from the Articles of Confederation, every state shall always keep up a well-regulated and disciplined militia sufficiently armed and accoutred. Accoutred means um, sword, in uh, a musket it would be musket balls, it would be powder, and other, other than the actual firearm, there were other things that men had to carry. Those are accoutrements. And the Articles of Confederation, for those who, of you who aren't aware, it was written uh, in Congress, 1777, a year after the Declaration, but the states didn't approve it until 1781. It was an interim form of government before the Constitution, 1787. Now here's a uh, quote from uh, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, 1776, which later became part of the Virginia, and is still in the Virginia Constitution well-regulated regu militia composed of the body of the people. Militia based on English tradition. The militia organization strongly based on the English Muster Law, 1572 and later, later regs. And that's a book uh, I have, uh, The Minutemen, by a, a major in the U.S. Army, published in uh, 1967. Massachusetts Bay Colony Militia Act, 13 December 1636 ordered the organization of Northeast and South Regions. Mass Bay Colony was around the Boston area and North Shore. Plymouth Colony was down in the South. Uh, then you had uh, Rhode Island, Providence, Connecticut, New Haven. New England Confederation of 1643, which was those colonies that I just mentioned, there was an agreement between four colonies, ordered that all males 16 to 60 of age be prepared for the defense of the four colonies party to the agreement. Uh, that spelling of defense, the, it, in the early 1800s, early to mid 1800s, it became D E F E N S E. The 1772 report of the Boston Committee Correspondence titled The Rights of the Colonists. And the Boston Committee Correspondence was a committee in Boston town meeting. And uh, it became known as the Boston Pamphlet, asserted that governments, Government was instituted for the purposes of common defense. The grand end of civil government, now he's, Samuel Adams is quoting Locke here, is for the support, protection, and defense of life, liberty, and property. Just briefly, how did the Committee of Correspondence differ from the Committee of Safety? The Committee of Correspondence, uh, their job was to publish documents and communicate with other committees <coughs> On the, on the local level, county level, state level. And they would communicate with horsemen like, say, Paul Revere? They communicate by horseback, yeah. the mail delivery, postal, postal mail delivery on horse, and uh, uh, also across the water by ship. 
and the Committee of Safety <clears throat> came about Massachusetts in 1774, and uh, it was when the, the provincial congresses took over, took government away from the British Crown officials in the colonies, and uh, for the defense and safety of the province. After a couple of weeks of commiserating in committee, they, they decided to form these committees or councils of safety. And their job was to uh, be the civilian control of the militia uh, when Congress was not in session. So they were 24-7 civilian control of the militia up until the state con they wrote state constitutions. So that began, the Committees of Safety began in 1774. Um, so that's that. And this is uh, after the December 1636 law or statute was passed at Mass Bay Colony. Here's a, here's a very nice painting by a very famous historical artist named Don Troy Ani. He's done many, many, many uh, paintings, and uh, one of them, there was a big painting of his in the, the room at the Tea Party Museum where we saw the video, on one of the walls, the painting was maybe from here to this high, and it was, I'm going to show you that painting, and that was a Don Troiani painting uh, at the Tea Party Museum. So here's a rendition of the first muster after that law was passed in Bay, uh, Bay Colony. And what Trani is known for is his accuracy in military uniforms and accoutrements. Interestingly, where did I see where did I first see this photograph? I didn't get it from the National Guard post, but that's where I saw it. Um, it's on, I found it on a Wikimedia. I guess it's a brother or sister of Wikipedia. And um, the quote there from that site, First Master Springs, 1630, Mass Bay Colony, the birth of United States National Guard. Okay, that's marketing. It's marketing from the National Guard, and I'm going to get into that. And it's wrong. That's correct. I'm going to get into that. And um, they still market that they uh, were formed uh, this as the first muster in December 1636 at the top. That's, they claim the National Guard was created on December 13, 1636. I know some of you are familiar with this statue on, Lex, on Battle Green in Lexington, Massachusetts. John Parker, he was the captain of the company on that date. This is the painting that was in the Boston Tea Party Museum on a on a, on a large wall. Uh, Lexington Common, 19th of April, 1775, Don Troiani. And you can see Parker there in the middle. All the other men have, have shouldered, the muskets are shouldered. He has his down and ready. This is also, now, this, the National Guard posted this one too. And they also posted this one. This is by a different artist, to execute the laws of the Union by Donna Neary. <clears throat> and this is my, my statement at the bottom. The militia of the several states were called forth to suppress the Whiskey Rebellion in Pennsylvania. And I think you probably all will recognize the man on the white horse at the head of the militia in Pennsylvania, George Washington. Okay, regarding this painting by Donna Neary, caption a photo posted on Flickr by the National Guard Bureau. Quote from the caption by the National Guard. First use of the Militia Law of 1792 to execute the laws of the Union and suppress insurrection. So, <clears throat> in uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, ins rebellion at the bottom there, and insurrection here, is used, it, the words are almost used interchangeably. Uh, this proud tradition of service to state and nation is carried on today by the Army and the National Guard. And as I said, I'm going to get into the, the differences. It's an important difference. Constitutional issue. 
The National Guard claims to be the organized militia. That's since 1903, federal statute. The composition today of the Army National Guard is 350,000 versus the body of we the people between 18 and 45, that's from the 1792, the age, the age uh, minimum and max from the 1792 Militia Act, out of a population, a current population of 321 million. So I did a little math, and uh, the 350,000 National Guard is that percentage, 0.35 percentage of what I would, less than a third, I would say, <clears throat> I used 100 million, which is less than a third of 321 million, and I just used a very rough guesstimate of how many would be between the ages of 18 and 45. Could be, give or take, less or minus 10 million, whatever. But uh, that just gives you an idea of the numbers where the <clears throat> the guard with only 350,000 claimed to be the militia, and uh, if the body, body of the people, we could have, I don't know, 80, 90, 100 million, 110 million within the 50 states. <clears throat> There's me, and if you can see the top, of, read the top, of, can, can, uh, in the back, can you read the top of the sign right there, what it says? Okay, that's, I wrote the same thing down the bottom. That's the sign outside... Uh, I was with Hal Shirtliff that day, Mr. Shirtliff, and uh, we stopped to take a photo this past winter. And uh, so they claim to be the militia when they're in state service. Or if the president called for the militia, they would be in federal service. According to their marketing and uh, the 1903 law, which is I call Vastly, I would call it perversion of the law, which is not really a law. Okay, National Guard of the United States. <clears throat> this is from, one of, uh, I think, Wikipedia. Title was used from 1824, but they claim they were started in 1636. But this is, this is what they say in their, own, in their own post, their own website. It was used from 1824 by some New York State militia units. It was an informal name. It was named after the French National Guard in honor of Marquis de Lafayette. National Guard became a standard nationwide militia title in 1903. Militia Act of 21 January 1903. The importance of the militia institutions, powers, and organization cannot be overstated relative to the mandate that we the people compose the militia. Understanding and answers are gained by going further into American fundamental principles and history. Okay, it's this back, back again, the Virginia Declaration of Rights. This is that section in full. That a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people. This is still in the Virginia Constitution. <clears throat> Train to arms is the proper national and safe defense of a free state. Now, the, the rest of this section is proof that uh, martial law cannot supersede civilian law. That in all cases, the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. Okay, there's a uh, clauses 12 through 16 of Article 1, Section 8 of the enumerated powers of Congress. <clears throat> 12 is the Army Clause. They have to vote to uh, appropriate revenue and money to support raise and support the army every two years. And Congress congressmen are elected every two years. Navy, Clause 13 Navy, the Navy has to always be maintained. It'll always be funded. There's no <coughs> vote there's no vote required to fund the Navy. <clears throat> to make rules for the government regulation of the land and naval forces. When you when I go further down in the Fifth Amendment, you'll see that the land and naval forces are the Army and the Navy together. And these two clauses, the next two, 15 and 16 militia clauses, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. <clears throat> clause I fo the phrase I focus on, the militia to execute the laws of the Union. And the, the organization clause, which, which is uh, where the National Guard is 100% wrong, 
to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, training the militia. The hundred million people are supposed to be organized, and it says it right there. We're supposed to be part of the militia, and we're supposed to be organized. So, and, I, and I'm going to get a little later into the phrase unorganized militia, which is nowhere in the Constitution, but it is in the 1903 law. And uh, if, if the Constitution mandates the organizing of the militia, how can a law supersede that and say that we the people are now the unorganized militia? And the National Guard is the organized militia. It, it's, uh, they did it, though. I mean, they did a lot in the early 1900s. The Federal Reserve Act, the Internal Revenue Service Act, 17th Amendment. A lot was going on in the early 1900s. <clears throat> early Federal Militia Acts passed by Congress to implement the Constitution's militia clauses. <clears throat> May 2nd, 1792 was the uh, act passed to detail and implement Clause 15, which is there, the May 2nd Act it goes into great detail about uh, the execution of the laws and it talks about the President calling forth the militia <clears throat> for federal service. May 8th, uh, six days later, uh, there was an act passed to detail and implement the organization in arming, disciplining of the militia, and training of the militia. And this is a quote from the May 8th Act. Be able-bodied white male citizen of the respective states who is or shall be of the age of 18 and under the age of 45, except as herein accepted. There are exceptions. Certain occupations were accepted because they were too important that they couldn't serve in the militia. Um, shall be enrolled in the militia. So you've got the you've got the mandate in the Constitution that says to provide for organizing our and disciplining the militia composed of the people, the body of the people, and then, then you have the statute, uh, everyone between 18 and 45 shall be enrolled in the militia, and that matches the, the, uh, the Virginia section 13 which says the body of the people. This is under uh, the executive branch. The President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when the militia is called into the actual service of the United States. So when I mention the Whiskey Rebellion, Washington <clears throat> called forth, per the request of Pennsylvania, he called forth the state militias to do service outside of their state, which, which can be done. So the militia are not a United States organization, they are a state, state or institution. Bill of Rights, Second Amendment. Most people know this one. Well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Fifth Amendment. <clears throat> um, and it talks about, here it talks about the land and naval forces or in the militia. So therefore you know that the militia are not considered land and naval forces at the Army and Navy. It didn't say it earlier in Section 8, but here it distinguishes it in the Fifth Amendment. And it talks about an actual service during the war or public danger, which could be the, could be the four state southern border of Mexico could be considered to be in public danger. <laughs> U.S. statutes at large. I mentioned before the Militia Act of 21 January 1903. <clears throat> the U.S. statutes at large is published every uh, session. Two-year sessions of Congress. They're elected every two years, and every t there's a session last two years. And if you want to find any law, the original act that was passed, you've got to go to the U.S. statutes at large, and they go back to all the way to 1789. <clears throat> Quote from the Militia Act, and uh, it's in my book. I have the, I have a photograph of the actual act. And these are these are photographs of the acts 
They're, um, this print is very small, but that's how I had to fit it on the page. And that's a caption of the parts of the act. And uh, that 1903 act asserted that the organized militia to be known as the National Guard. <clears throat> okay, that's, we saw before where the New York militia informally called itself the National Guard since 1824, but this is the first time it's mentioned in federal statute. And then 13 years later, the National Defense Act, which today is called the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, <clears throat> 3 June 1916 federalized the National Guard, which claimed to be, claims to be still the organized militia, under the Army. The 1916 militia organization is codified today at Title 10 in the <coughs> United States Code, <coughs> Section 311. So when you go in uh, any library, law library, state, state house library, you go to, uh, you want to look up a law, current law, what you're actually looking at is the code. Revised statutes, for instance, New Hampshire is called the NHRSA. Uh, New Hampshire revised statutes annotated. Uh, Maine, it's called the uh, MRS, Maine revised statutes. Revised means you have a statute and then it's amended. As, as time moves on chronologically and the code, they keep the code up to date, they reprint the books every couple of years. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, the, uh, the Guard was, consi was considered to be the militia in 1903, and then they federalized the Guard 13, 13 years. Oops. Clause 12 Army taking over the Clause 15 and 16 militia. I want to go back. Okay, you got the Army, Clause 12. You get the Navy Clause 13, you get the Militia Clause 15 and 16. Now back to the oops. And I asked the question, if the Army can take over, the Clause 12 Army can take over the Clause 15 and 16 Militia, can the Navy take over the Army? Why can't the Navy take over the Army? These, these clauses, they're not, usually they're not numbered in most pocket constitutions, but there's a few that do have the numbers of the clauses. And each clause, 12 through 16 and throughout, <coughs> in this particular Congressional Enumerated Powers, Section 8, each clause is separate and distinct from all the other clauses. In other words, the Navy can't go in and take over the Army. The Army can't go in and take over the Navy. I think the Marines would have a problem with the Army trying to take over the Navy. And, uh, but why can't the Army come down and take over Clause 15 and 16? How do they, how do they get away with that? Well, could the post office take over the Army? <laughs> right, right. So that's, but that's what they did. In, in actuality, that's what happened. So that's why I say the oops. The 19, up just above that, the 1916, June, 3 June 1916, they federalized the Army under the National Defense. It was a certain section of that big, huge National Defense Act that year. And that's why, going back to the picture, right there, what does it say? It says Army National Guard, right? Because they're federalized since 1916. Questions. What is the conflict of discrepancy between the Virginia and U.S. Constitution's militia clauses, the Militia Act of 1792, and the claims of both the National Guard and the Militia Act of 1903? Well, they, they're unconstitutional. It's, I, I just simply say the, the, uh, the laws that, where the, they claim that the National Guard is the militia are unconstitutional. Is there a century-old century fraud and false claim conspiracy in effect? Uh, uh, Mr. Taught the, he was talking about conspiracy? The Kalis. Kalis, right. Well, this, this would be one of those that could be an actual, not a theory, but an actual thing. Uh, what effects on the operational, what are these, what do these, 
What effects do these have on the operational powers of we the people? Well, and anybody can chime in. We can't, because we were disbanded in 1903, the we the people are no longer the militia, according to false, fraudulent statute uh, that's in effect. We lost our power to execute the laws that will enforce the Constitution. Go ahead, Bob. I just wanted to... Oh, Mr. Seeley, excuse me. Okay. Militia, but they, 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 if I know somebody and then uh, he's an active military, but he's also the National, National Guard, so they, how can they, if it's the militia, how can they just say, hey, you know, we're taking all your equipment and everything and sending it off to Afghanistan and Iraq, which they did? Uh, uh, during World War One, when they were federalized in 1916, they were able to do that. They were in the Iraq war on Afghanistan. It's still the same now. Yeah. Um, they had a problem in the Spanish-American War of 1898. He had state militias. Before, before the 1903 Act, he had operational state militias. And, but the states wouldn't let their militiamen be sent to, to fight with the, Teddy Roosevelt in Cuba or to go fight in the Philippines, which they took over at the conclusion of that war. The United States, they became territories of the United States, temporarily. Um, so there, there was a problem. For, you know, as far as the war-making uh, government officials, they wanted to send these men outside the country to fight war. They took all their equipment. But the, but the, the equipment was supposed to stay here for yeah. uh, you know, snow removal or whatever. And, right. and, and they sent it all over there, and, then, and now they're just leaving it there. and. and, and and they also given them junkie. It's more expensive you know, to bring it back. Yeah. Stuff, you know? Yep. Well, it all comes down to we don't understand the Constitution, and so we allow the usurpations of powers not granted instead of making them null, void, and of no effect. Correct. Correct. <coughs> okay. There are 7,300 state legislators in the 50 states. They, they are, as far as this subject matter, the most important politicians relative to the necessity to restore the constitutional powers of the purse and the sword. And that's from Dr. Vieira. That's a phrase he used. It's an ancient phrase, but he brought it back to modern use. <clears throat> and the purse is to talking about what Ron Paul talked about, restore sound money. He wrote that book, Restore Sound Money. This is the power of the purse. And uh, so, <clears throat> what I'm saying is, the state legislators are important and necessary uh, to the restoration of constitutional money transactions, constitutional security, and uh, constitutional enforcement, execution of the laws, constitutional homeland security, not the department, not, not DHS, which is not constitutional. And uh, here's myself uh, five years ago. We were at Nat Nurses Hall yesterday, for those, on the, for those that went on the field trip, uh, exercising my rights with a group of people. We all assembled. Twa uh, Mr. Moore was there, exercising the right to assemble, the right to free, uh, the freedom of speech, instructing state legislators. We went around and we talked to legislators. That was Constitution Day 2010 at Nurses Hall in the Massachusetts State House. Okay. Dr. Vieira, he's, so, he's, he's an informal mentor of mine. In my book, uh, he, there's a website, newswithviews.com. He has an archive of commentaries that go back to 2005 when he started writing about the power of the purse and, and constitutional money. And um, from that website, his archive on News with Views, I got permission from Dr. Vieira to republish um, one of the titles of a commentary, Are You Doing a Constitutional Duty for Homeland Security? That was 2000, May 2005, for example, and I have several of his commentaries in here. And uh, he's, a, uh, he's a prolific writer. Crashmaker uh, was a novel. He, uh, he was a co-author under a nom de plume, and uh, Crashmaker was about the, uh, the crash of the Federal Reserve System. And Pieces of Eight, 1,700-page book about uh, constitutional money. And there was a, uh, a sample piece of legislation to restore for state legislators to use to restore sound money. It was in the back of that book. How to Destroy the Imperial Judiciary, Constitutional Homeland Security. I showed you that book. 
uh, the sword and sovereignty, uh, colon, the constitutional principles of the militia of the several states. That book, 2012, is on CD only, and it's 2,300 pages on CD. 13, wor at, 13 words. Uh, Go ahead, Mr. Moore. So, I, I, love, I love Ed Vieira, but as Dan has said, these are many, these are dictionary thick books. And he is such a scholar that he writes on a level that goes over my head all the time. So I think you can almost buy Dan's book, which is kind of the Reader's Digest version, and get a much better overview and understand it better than reading some of those super, super thick books. Yeah. I would highly recommend he, Dan's book. Yeah. Sure. The next ones I'm mentioning, he, 13 words, that's only 122 pages. And that fits in the jet, you have sport jacket po side pocket. I still think you explained it better. Buddy. Right. <laughs> so he, it, after in 2012, he published 2,300 words as all the 6,000 footnotes, and then 122 page, about this thick, uh, 13 words, and the 13 are the is the first clause of the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, and then he, uh, that same year, three rights, and then his most recent book. And there's, a, there's a, a documentary being produced right now uh, titled Martial Law, and his book is uh, Tyranny of Necessity, the Bastardy of Martial Law. That's his book. Okay, the Constitution and Militia are not, as here specified, this is, as I mentioned, the, the uh, revised statutes, the U.S. Code, Title 10, Section 311. And this is uh, right from the 1916 statute. And it uh, talks has the ages up above, and then on the bottom, the classes of militia are the organized militia, which consists of the National Guard and the Naval Militia, and two, the unorganized militia. Now, the unorganized militia is a phrase that was in the 19. It wasn't in the 1903. It was in the 19. It doesn't matter what year it is, but it's there. It's in federal statute, and so the code has the same thing right in there. Which consists an organized militia, which consists of members of the militia who are not members of the National Guard. So it's the body of we the people in that age bracket. Uh, in one state, which has probably the best existing law uh, in Maine, <clears throat> all the governor has to do, he just can sign an executive order and he can say, I'm enrolling the militia. And he, the statute's already there. Local commanding officers, county commanding officers, the sheriff and the judge can call out, request the county commanding officer to call out the militia. The mayors or the uh, selectmen, city council, they can request the local commanding officer to call out the militia. But it has, says the governor can enroll with an, by an order, can enroll the militia, or the state, main state legislature could write a new statute, which is preferable. So the issue. <clears throat> The issue here is you go back to um, Clause 15, well actually, uh, Executive Branch, uh, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1, talks about the President calling for, uh, his Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States in the militia of the several states. But what does this say up here? It says, it mentions a non-existent entity, the militia of the United States. There is no such thing. So the issue at the bottom there I, are these phrases, militia of the United States, national guard, <coughs> unorganized militia, don't exist in the Constitution. There's an explicit and strict separation of powers between the Clause 12 Army of the United States and the Clause 15 Militia of the several states. Clause 12, rate armies, Clause 15, the militia to execute the laws. So there's, the army in, in the Constitution it doesn't say the army can execute the laws, press erections, and pull invasions. That's a militia power. It's not an army power. It's not a navy power on domestic, on American soil. And then again, <clears throat> the army, navy of the United States, the militia of the several states. The several. I've been asked this question: What does the several mean? It means all the states. However, when it was 13, it was the several states. When it's 50, it's the several states. Second Amendment. Okay, you know that one? Fifth Amendment. We went, th went through that. The militia went in actual service in the war of, time of war, public danger. Okay, question. 
Who, in a non-emergency, who executes the laws 24-7 on an everyday basis? Police department, sheriffs, go ahead. The executive branch? Correct. Correct. That's right, because they're, they're, the executive branch is in charge of executing the laws that the legislative branch wrote. Would um, police be considered somehow part of the executive branch? The, yes, yes. In local local government, the the right. police are executive branch. Um, so I mentioned the federal the federal militia acts, and uh, and so throughout 1792, this is the organization of the militia. 1795, so actually it was the not the organization, the ex the powers of the ex to execute the laws. <clears throat> 1861. This section, section 9, is repeated every time there's a new law written regarding the execution of the laws. I found this in the U.S. statutes at large. Marshals of the several districts and their deputies shall have the same powers in executing the laws of the United States as sheriffs and deputies in the several states have by law in executing the laws of their respective states. So back then, <clears throat> up until at least according to this, the Civil War, the marshals uh, executed the laws, executed federal law, and sheriffs executed state law. Legis state legislatures wrote laws, Congress wrote federal law. So those were the, and then you had the local constables county sheriff and the local constable. So that's the 24-7 everyday execution of the law and the militia is specifically for emergencies or when the Constitution isn't being enforced. The well-regulated militia of the several states are to execute this Constitution and the laws made in pursuance thereof when necessary to the security of a free state. That's the militia enforcement mechanism so that should be we the people's enforcement mechanism. We're the superseding authority, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, the laws of nature and nature's God, that's from the Declaration, and the superseding authority of we the people under natural and constitutional law emphasize a chief reason that the militia are enumerated and mandated to be composed of the whole body of we the people. The militia are the several states in the people's institutions, through which we the people are to exercise our superseding constitutional authority when necessary. To restore a republic, the people need to, one, take the moral spiritual high ground, as I mentioned before, and take the constitutional high ground. People will need to educate themselves, organize locally, and instruct the legislators. Executing the laws and enforcing our constitution is about participating as part of we the people, including in part, to instruct your elected officials in the mandated execution of their enumerated duties and powers in order, excuse me, in order that they by statute provide for the common defense of life, liberty, and property of we the people and the free exercise of individual rights and individual liberty. The legislative goal of constitutional restoration. Pass one or two bills in the several states' legislatures into law that will restore constitutional money and transactions and that will revitalize the enumerated well-regulated militia that are enumerated to execute the laws per the Second Amendment and Clause 15 when necessary to the security of a free state. Note, I mentioned Article 6, Clause 2 before. Uh, this Constitution and the laws which shall be made in pursuance thereof. And also in that Article 6, Clause 2, this is what they call the Supremacy Clause. Some of you may have heard that phrase, Supremacy Clause, and it's uh, uh, re referring to federal supremacy over states. And regarding uh, uh, the same law, uh, the U.S. Constitution, the state Constitution can't supersede the federal constitution and state law 
on the same subject matter can't supersede federal law if it's constitutional. Now, this is the note we got the 1903 Militia Act. This is where we get down to the nitty gritty here on what the states can do and, 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 and the federal can't do anything about it. Note, the Article 6 Supremacy Clause could not legitimately validate the earlier repugnant federal statutes to supersede what we need, new constitutional state militia laws. The existing law, federal law, can't super, could not supersede new state law because those statutes since 1903 were not made in pursuance of this Constitution as required by Article 6. So a state, legis the state legislature could just pass the law and uh, Obama or whoever the President is or whoever the uh, United States Attorney General is, is, would, might say, no, we're going to come in, we're going to take over. You can't do that. And, uh, but the legislator should just tell them to go pound sand because the uh, the 1903 Act is uh, unconstitutional. Yeah, We're all true. supposed to be organized. Go ahead, Mr. Steele. What about, uh, like somebody, uh, what is it, California or whatever, legalized marijuana, but now Obama's saying they have a right to go in and, and, and clamp down on it or whatever. Does that, that, that have anything to do with that? He's probably claiming it under the Commerce. They claim all kinds of things under the Commerce Clause. Yeah. But that's probably where he's getting it. Uh, oh. It's another usurpation of power not granted. There right. is no federal jurisdiction so they have, granted they don't, over if drugs. If the state legalizes that, then the federal government under this has no right to stop them. Well, those, you know, where I had the clauses 12 through 16 in Article 1, Section 8, yeah. the Army, the Navy, the Militia, that's the Section 8 is the, as we heard, the campus heard before, uh, congressional po uh, enumerated powers. And, uh, you know, Regulating the federal government regulating marijuana is not amongst those powers. It's got Congress passing a law to do that. So maybe you'll, I don't know how the president is doing it, whether he's just doing it by executive order or what. But yeah. federal drug law probably is just as unconstitutional as federal gun control law. Yeah. I would assume. So, so the under the Constitution, the federal government can regulate interstate trade of marijuana, but not the legality of possession, use, or growth. Or trade. I don't, I don't want to get into too much detail of that, but I just, I'll just say about the Commerce Clause, uh, the reason it, it was put in there from what I read was so there could be commerce between the states, amongst the states, and they couldn't uh, charge tariffs on each other. It, so it, was, goes, it goes back to the original meaning of to regulate in 1787, which meant to make regular. It was not to micromanage. Right. Because, yes, the states were, you know, Virginia was treating New York as if it was France. And every time a good crossed a border, there were import duties and export duties and customs. So, so basically, it was to make sure that people in Virginia could sell their stuff in Massachusetts and people in Rhode Island could sell their stuff in South Carolina. Right. Okay, so uh, the goal in the state, in the states, is simply pass legislation uh, to restore the constitutional powers of the person of sort. How, how are we doing for time? It's we're ten minutes past time. Already. We are yeah. really all right. Summation: Those early twentieth century acts, blah blah blah, Mar Marbury versus Madison, actually repugnant. Okay. The early 20th century acts failed to meet Article 6 requirements, violated uh, Clause 16, disbanded we the people, created constitutionally non existent, unorganized militia, mm -hmm. violated the explicit separation of powers between Clause <coughs> the, the Army of the United States and the militia of the several states. This must be changed in order to restore the Republic. Take the moral, spiritual high ground, educate ourselves on, print on the principles, organize the community, instruct the state legislators, pursue remedy, follow through, restore our Republic. And there's a couple of quotes from George Mason. We don't have time. Elvis Jerry regarding what, what is the militia. And uh, I'm going to have a website called Committees of Correspondence.org, and people can do what Sam Adams did in 1772. And to close, thank you very much, and thank God you, bless. God bless you in your future endeavors. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome.